Ladies and gentlemen, a new snapshot for Minecraft Java Edition 1.17 The Caves and Cliffs update has been released. Here is 20W49A with skulk sensors, the dripstone caves biome and a whole load of other fixes and tweaks to previously added features. My name is Slice Slime, I'm here to guide you through all the changes in this snapshot. And let's start with the skulk sensors. A skulk sensor is a detector of vibrations. Anything that vibrates within an 8 block radius around it will trigger the skulk sensor. A vibration in the game is anything that causes a physical motion. If you are careful, you can avoid being detected by a skulk sensor by sneaking. The actions that you can hide by sneaking this way include walking around, of course, but also falling to the ground and shooting a projectile or throwing a projectile. One exception here is that skulk sensors will not listen to any kind of vibrations that are directly caused by another skulk sensor. Once a vibration is detected, a signal is sent from the source to the sensor. The signal is visible and moves at a speed of one game tick per block traveled. When the signal has arrived, the sensor will activate and it will stay active for two seconds. While activated, the sensor cannot detect any other vibrations. And after deactivating, there's also a cooldown period of one tick before they can activate again. This cooldown also applies when a skulk sensor has just been placed. If there's a wool block in the way of the vibration source, then the sensor will not be able to detect it. Skulk sensors can be waterlogged and the efficient tool to mine them is a hoe. What happens when a skulk sensor is activated is that they emit a redstone signal. The strength of this signal decreases with the distance from the source. That means that if the source is right on top of the skulk sensor, then you get maximum output all the way down to minimum output when the source is 8 blocks away. There's another side to this as well, vibration frequencies. These frequencies can be detected using a comparator next to a skulk sensor. Each vibration in the game falls in a certain category of vibrations and this value can be measured with a comparator. There are 15 different categories of vibrations and each one has a value. That value corresponds to the redstone signal strength that the comparator measures. The different types are walking for 1, flying sounds for 2, swimming sounds for 3, falling with elytra sounds for 4, hitting the ground after falling for 5, splashing into water or a wolf shaking water out of its fur for 6, beginning to eat or shooting a projectile at 7, finishing eating and a projectile hitting a block for 8, an entity being hit or an item being added to an armor stand for 9, for signal strength 10 a whole host of different vibration types, for closing a block like a trapdoor or a door, or a container like a chest, for a lever turning off or a pressure plate or button unpressing, for a tripwire disconnecting from a tripwire hook, or for a dispense failing. Also a lot of different vibration types for 11, they are pressing a button or a pressure plate, attaching a tripwire to a tripwire hook, opening a container or a block and switching on a lever. At 12, placing a block or fluid or using a flint and steel. At 13, destroying or mining a block as well as picking up a fluid. 14, reeling in a fishing rod or a piston contracting. And 15, finally, casting a fishing rod, a piston extending, explosions going off or lightning striking. With that, let's leave the skulk behind and move on to world generation changes. This version introduces a new biome, it is the Dripstone Caves biome. This biome cannot yet be found in the world, but you can use it as part of custom world generation, including selecting it as a single biome world. This biome is designed for upcoming larger caves, however, you can try it out in the existing cave generation. As expected, dripstone caves contain plenty of pointed dripstone on the floors and the ceilings, and small pools of water. In some places you'll also find larger stalagmites, stalactites, and columns built from dripstone blocks. Speaking of dripstone, let's move on to changes and fixes to dripstone. Stalagmites and stalactites merge if the ticks are next to each other when placed. However, now there's also a way to avoid this by holding shift while placing the second block. A number of bug fixes have also been done to stalactites falling. Large pillars of stalactites didn't fall when the block above was removed. 
and a number of problems with the hitbox of a pointed dripstone have been fixed where it would extend into neighboring blocks, causing all kinds of problems. There were also problems with stalactites duplicating itself or destroying other items. Cauldrons can now be filled by a stalactite dripping water into them even if the stalactite is two blocks tall or more. Waterlogged stalagmites will now update and spread their water properly. And Driftstone no longer creates water particles in the nether. If you landed on the frustum state block of a stalagmite then you wouldn't take any damage that is fixed in this version. And there are new death messages for getting killed by falling stalactites. They are, your player name was skewered by a falling stalactite, and if you were fighting an entity while it happened, it will be, player name was skewered by a falling stalactite whilst fighting, and the entity's name. Let's talk about some fixes for copper as well. Waxing cut copper will now prevent it from oxidizing properly, and mining double copper slabs will now properly drop two slabs, not just one. User interface changes in this version. The text showing the fullness of a bundle will now show up in the tooltip of a bundle regardless of whether you have advanced tooltips turned on or off. And a few fixes have been done to the heart display on the headset display. This includes absorption hearts appearing empty if you had poison or wither hearts, and those same absorption hearts being broken when taking freezing damage. Hardcore hearts also lost all their colors when the player was taking freezing damage, and that is fixed in this version. Sound changes in this version. Of course, there are new sounds for the skulk sensors. There's a sound for breaking them. For placing them. For walking on them. And a click when they start detecting something. And when they stop detecting something. A change for servers in this version. One of the fields in the server properties file has been removed. It is the max build height setting. Let's move on to technical changes in this version and let's start with a brand new system. It is called the game event system which has been implemented to support the skulk sensors detecting vibrations. In this system a set of name the game events can trigger and these events can then be used by certain parts of the code for some effect. Obviously, these are currently used for the skulk sensors. The different event names are Step, Swim, Flap, Elytra Freefall, Hit Ground, Splash, Projectile Shoot, Projectile Land, Entity Hit, Block Place, Block Destroy, Fluid Place, Fluid Pickup, Block Open, Block Close, Block Switch, Block Unswitch, Block Attach, Block Detach, Block Press, Block Unpress, Container open, container close, explode, armor stand add item, wolf shaking, dispense fail, fishing rod cast, fishing rod reel in, piston extend, piston contract, flint and steel use, eating start, eating finish, and lightning strike. Let's move on to tags, but let's stay on the topic of game events. There can now be game event tags. You place those under data, your namespace, tags, and game events. For the Minecraft default namespace, there are two tags defined. They are vibrations, determining which game events are considered vibrations by the Skulk sensor. That is currently all of the defined game events. And then there's a second tag called ignore vibrations stepping carefully. This contains a list of all of the events that should be ignored by the Skulk sensor when the source is sneaking. By default, this includes step, hit ground, and projectile shoot. There are new block tags in this version as well. There is an occludes vibration signals block tag. By default, this contains the wool block tag. Another new block tag is the dripstone replaceable blocks. This contains all the blocks that dripstone can replace during generation. By default, this contains the base stone types and dirt. There's a fix for a tag error as well. Optional function tags sometimes didn't run even though the tag existed. That has been fixed in this version. Particle news! There are two new particle types in this version. They are vibration and dust color transition. Both of these are pretty special. They take extra parameters and if you want to trigger them through the particle command, you'll need to understand what these parameters are. The vibration command takes two sets of three doubles. These are coordinates of the from position and the to position. 
and then that is followed by an int parameter, which is a travel time in ticks. For the dust color transition, that also has parameters. They are a source color and a target color and a scale. A command fix in this version. If you set any floating block to a pointing dip zone instead, this would cause the replaced block to drop as an item rather than vanishing. That is fixed in this version. And let's talk about custom worlds. World height related values are now exposed for custom worlds. In specific, dimension types now have a min y and a height field. And noise settings now also have a min y field. In addition to this, another change for noise settings is that the bedrock roof position minimum value is no longer capped at negative 10, it is now unbounded. There are three new feature types in this version, they are dripstone, cluster, large dripstone, and small dripstone. Finally, a number of stability and performance improvements, including performance improvements for rendering signs and banners and crash fixes. Speaking of stability, even though those fixes are in here, this is a testing version, and testing versions are inherently less stable. So if you want to try this version, do so on a backup of your world or on a separate test world. Keep in mind that any world that you open in this version can never be safely downgraded to a previous version again. If you want to try this version out but you have no idea how to, then click on the link in the iCard on the video or in the video description to take you to a tutorial video about how to get and play a Minecraft snapshot. That was all I had for you this time. I hope you found this update video useful, and if you did, please help me out in return, leave a like, and share it with a friend. If you want to stay up to date with all the latest additions to Minecraft Java Edition, then please subscribe to this channel. I make videos for every new snapshot, pre-release, release candidate, and full release. And don't forget to hit that bell icon and select all to get notified when the videos are done. My name is Lyslime, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.